Obviously, all of you at a very young age didn't just decide to, uh, you know, do a little bungee jumping, maybe run one New York marathon, not to disparage any of that, but you have made a commitment, a lifetime commitment to the outdoors. Susan, I know in meeting you when we first covered the Iditarod for ABC when you were in your uh, winning years there, I remember you were telling me about growing up in Massachusetts and you knew as a little girl that the wilderness, something was drawing you. Can you tell us about, you know, those, those yearnings early on? Well, um, I, I was raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I spent my summers in Maine, so I was sort of able to see the difference between uh, city and country, and um, my mother certainly remembers me at age two expressing that I didn't like the city, and uh, my first composition in first grade was, I hate the city. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to fourth grade, I was a little bit uh, more thorough, where I discussed what I thought society, how society was ruining the earth. And um, I did. I, I was born with this passion for the wilderness and very much for animals. Uh, right away, I spent a lot of my life uh, working with many different types of animals, but I had a pet dog when I was four, and that became my mainstay. And so it made a lot of sense uh, to keep sort of traveling north and west. And by the time I was 20, I had reached Alaska and I went out to live in the Alaskan bush. Um, so I lived 150 miles from the closest road. The closest town there at that time was um, almost 500 miles away from me. My closest neighbor was 40 miles away. And of course I had no electricity or running water and that was what I wanted. But I had every type of northern type of animal around me on a daily basis and I had a challenge and the challenge was just to survive through each day uh, with the four dogs that I took out with me. And we taught each other. And it was my childhood dream come true and it was absolutely utopic for me and I've been able to build a life around that, build a lifestyle and, uh, and make a life for myself and now my family doing what I thought I wanted to do when I was two. And I'm telling you, this is a life of hardship. I have visited uh, Susan and her husband on this homestead, and uh, they literally get up in the morning, chop how much chop ice to make water. Am I right? Right. Well, um, on the good days, we can go down to the creek, and you can chop. You can find it's a very small creek, and it glaciers over in the winter, so you have to search for water. And on a good day, you can find water. And on a bad day, you bring up the ice and you melt the ice. Uh, we do have the capabilities of having electricity now. We have a diesel generator if we need it, but at 40 and 50 below temperatures, uh, diesel freezes and you have all sorts of problems and so you're really just better off burning wood and uh, going without. And so we still live without plumbing or electricity and it's, it's a wonderful life, but it does take time and there is a lot of work. I have right now 94 dogs and so it's a family, family thing. My daughter has her set of dogs. She's four years old. She has her set of dogs to take care of also. So, Bob, maybe I could say to you, I had read in your biography that you, were, you loved 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. What, what, what caught you early on? Well, I was uh, born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I vaguely remember it. Uh, my father was a test pilot during the war and I grew up in San Diego and I was a little, you know, kid that lived on the beach. That was back in the old days when the, you could actually go out and your parents wouldn't worry about you. And a uh, hundred yards from our house was uh, the Pacific Ocean. And I used to always want to be the first set of footprints. I think it was not only 20,000 leagues under the sea but Robinson Crusoe. I wanted to look for Friday, you know. I wanted to go and be the first set of footprints. And also what's so beautiful about Southern California is the, the tidal pools. And I used to go into the tidal pools and, and, and every 12 hours they changed. And so it was, a, it was an adventure. You could never get tired because it was never the same. It was like a kaleidoscope of the ocean. And I would go in there and sometimes there would be a, an octopus that was hiding Another time there might be a crab that was going to defend itself to the, to the death. And I just fell in love with the ocean, but I fell in love with wondering what was down there. I mean, I looked out across the ocean, never became a surfer. That seemed like something I just didn't want to do. 
but I always wanted to go underwater. And it began with just, you know, holding my breath and going down. And uh, then I graduated to snorkeling, and then I graduated to scuba, and then finally I graduated to deep diving submarines. And I've just had a curiosity as a child that my teachers and my parents and everyone kept feeding that flame of curiosity. I think all kids are born explorers. I think we all have these fundamental questions that we want to know answers to. And some of us, the process extinguishes the curiosity. You stop asking those questions. You, you don't get answers, so you stop asking them. And I feel even if I don't get some of the answers to the ultimate questions, I'm going to keep trying to get answers. And, and that's what I think explorers do. They're trying to get answers to things. Uh, my dad being in the French Navy and always wanted to know what was under the keel of his ships uh, finally uh, came to his senses and quit the Navy and went and explored what was below the surface. And that's when he pushed me overboard together with my mother and my brother. <laughs> and uh, we've been uh, diving ever since. I was seven years old. My brother, my late brother was four and a half. And uh, it became a family affair, although I didn't really know that we were amongst pioneers. And uh, very quickly I realized that my own backyard, where I grew up in south of France, uh, was being trashed. And uh, things changed very quickly and so quickly that uh, I can tell you today, I cannot take my own children or your kids and show them what I used to see when I was a kid. So uh, very quickly, as my dad invited me to join him on expeditions, uh, did I decide to uh, dedicate my life to a better understanding of what's below the surface, which still today, with everything we've done, Bob and many other people, uh, is still very abstract to the general public. Well, what we forgot is, uh, or still forget, is that the quality of our lives depend on the quality of the ocean. And the salinity of the ocean is the same as the salinity of our blood. So we, we really have a tie which we need to understand better and protect for the quality of our lives and the ones of future generations. So I'm in it for the rest of my life. Yes, you know, when you say that, I, Tom, I was reading, I was so interested in your Everest climb. You actually had an environmental aspect to it, too. You did a huge cleanup campaign, didn't you? Tell us a little bit about that. I've always had a very strong um, affiliation with uh, the environment and doing things the right way. It's, it's not just the outcome, it's not just getting to the top, it's how you get to the top is important. And if as mountaineers we despoil our own bed and we uh, don't take care of the thing that we cherish, then we are really not doing the thing the right way. And uh, there are two responsibilities, I believe, in mountaineering. One is to climb the mountain in authentic, authentic mountaineering fashion, which means that you do it on your own abilities. The second is to do it with not just a leave no trace uh, ethic, but you actually try and um, restore somewhat uh, some of the um, excesses of other expeditions. And with um, my um, co-leader of the expedition, Angela Hawes, um, for a, her master's de degree, she involved herself in this cleanup in which we uh, took down 89 oxygen cylinders and a thousand pounds of garbage from the mountain and then using, thank you. In fact, the applause should definitely go to Angela and not to myself and they should also go to the Prescott College students, six of whom um, were involved in a service learning project with the expedition and then oversaw the recycling of the oxygen cylinders, the batteries and the garbage that we took off the mountain to the strictest environmental protocols. And um, so that was a project that uh, was very dear to my heart and an important part of our expedition.